Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video with Swagglehoss. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about 10 books to invest in on a $100 budget. That's right, in this video, it's gonna be an investment video, and I've identified 10 books that I really like at this price point. But before I get into the books, if you guys could drop me a like or comment or subscribe if you're enjoying the content, help support the channel doing those things, I'd appreciate it. But let us get into the video here today. Now, of course, because this is an investment video, we gotta do a little bit of a disclaimer. Always buy what you like, you know, don't just listen to me, do your own research. Now, additionally, I'm giving you guys books that are in a price window, meaning, you know, maybe some of these you can find right now as buy it nows on eBay for under the $100 range. Maybe some of them are gonna have to be, you know, above $100, you know, you're gonna have to use a little bit of patience. Maybe you're gonna have to find that one copy out there in the wild at an LCS. But generally speaking, if you can find any of these books around this price point, I think you're gonna be doing really good overall. Now that I got all the caveats out of the way, let's get into my first pick. And my first pick is actually gonna be Marvel Premiere number 47 from 1979. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would be the first appearance of Scott Lang as Ant-Man in Marvel comic books. Now, of course, you guys know Scott Lang is the Ant-Man character that is played by Paul Rudd in the MCU. And this book right here would be the first time that Scott Lang would take up the costume of the Ant-Man character. And I really do like this book. I mean, when we think about, you know, the character of Ant-Man, how much they have grown throughout, you know, the last couple phases of the MCU in terms of their popularity, it really does feel like Scott Lang, even in Marvel comic books, is sort of the go-to Ant-Man, even over that of Henry Pym. And for that reason, I really like this book as being one that can continue to grow to higher values in the future. On top of that, I really do like that this is also the first appearance of Cassie Lang. Cassie Lang, of course, is the daughter of Scott Lang. And it seems like Cassie is going to have, you know, some significant role in the MCU in the future. I mean, of course, later on, she would take up the mantle of stature and other characters like that. This is also the first appearance of Darren Cross. Darren Cross was the character played by Corey Stoll in the Ant-Man franchise. Seems like he's going to be making a return in Ant-Man number three. On top of that, there's already talks that Ant-Man is going to be cameoing in the Marvel's movie. So that should go to show that, you know, they really do believe in this character. And we're going to see a lot of him in the future. And if you can get this book around that one, $100 price point, which I think is very, very possible to do, you know, especially in those VF to near mint copies, I think you're going to do really well for yourself in the future. All right, let's go on now to my second pick here. My second pick is actually going to be Fantastic Four number 94 from 1970. And what is the significance of this? Well, of course, you guys know this is the first appearance of Agatha Harkness, the character that was played by Katherine Hahn in the WandaVision series. Now, of course, this is a book that, you know, has been popular in the market for quite some time. I mean, when we initially got WandaVision, this was one of those books that absolutely exploded in the market. But this one has had a big correction from where it once was. And I now am able to find copies, you know, nice presenting kind of mid-grade-ish copies being sold around that $100 price point. And being that this is a book, you know, from 1970, it's a Stanley book, it's a Fantastic Four book. I really do like this book as an investment buy. I mean, we already know that Agatha is going to be getting her own Disney Plus show. So just that alone is going to give this book, you know, a, a boost in its value once we actually start to see images and trailers for that show. On top of that, I really do think the character of Agatha Harkness has a lot of potential for the future. I mean, she already has all these connections to Wanda and the sort of like, you know, mystical world of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but she has a strong tie and a strong foundation to the Fantastic Four. She was the nanny of Franklin Richards, for instance. So I think there's a lot of potential to utilize Katherine Hahn in many projects in the future. And I can really see Agatha Harkness uh, growing into a bigger character than she is in the comic books. All right, let's go on now to my third pick here. My third pick might be the first book where we're kind of stretching our budget, but I do think it's possible to find this one for a hundred dollars. And the book I'm talking about here is Marvel premiere number one from 1972. This is the first appearance of him as Adam Warlock, a book written by Roy Thomas. And of course we know that in Guardians of the Galaxy 3, we're gonna be getting Will Porter as Adam Warlock. A lot of the Adam Warlock keys definitely saw a spike up in the market. And in particular, the Thor 165, the first full appearance of him seems to be the book that you know the market commands as being the most valuable. And that makes sense. It's an older book from 1968. So there's probably gonna be a precedent for it commanding a higher premium just due to the age of the book. But this one right here, 
here to me feels like this might be the book that we look back on as the one to own for the character because of the fact that this is when he actually takes up the mantle of Warlock. And in this storyline, it is the high evolutionary that turns him into the Warlock character. And from what we know about Guardians of the Galaxy 3, we're going to be seeing the high evolutionary as one of the villains of that. And if, you know, the story sort of follows what we see in this book right here, I mean, collectors are going to connect the dots and they're going to value this book as the one that relates to the movie the most. So I really do like this book for that reason. On top of that, it has some other unique factors. It's the first appearance of the Soul Gem. It's the first appearance of Counter Earth. You know, there's talks right now that we might be getting Counter Earth in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie as well. There's been hints at that. So I really do like this book for this price range. Now, you might not be able to find it right away at the $100 level, but I've certainly seen live auctions on eBay sell for like that 115 to 120 level. Uh, I saw a few copies, you know, as recently at WonderCon, you know, under the $100 price point, you know, at that VG uh, grade. So I really do think that if you can use your patience and find a book at this price point, you're going to do very well for yourself. Now, of course, if you're thinking to yourself, Swagglehoss, I don't think you can find this book for $100. Well, I have this other suggestion for you, and that, of course, is Strange Tales number 178. That would be the first time that Jim Starlin writes the Warlock character. It would also be the first appearance of Magnus and the first appearance of the Universal Church of Truth. I like this book as well as just a great Adam Warlock cover buy. I think if you can find a really nice high-grade version of Strange Tales 178 for this price point, uh, you're also going to do very well for yourself because because I actually do think that it's possible that we could see Magus as being the ultimate villain in Guardians of the Galaxy 3 as well. So either way, if you can find a nice lower grade of Marvel Premiere 1 or a higher grade of Strange Tales 178, I think you're going to do well for your $100 budget, especially when you get them in a slab. And speaking of slabs, let's take a moment to talk about the sponsor of this video, MySlabs.com. The platform designed by collectors for collectors just got even better. MySlabs.com is proud to now feature dedicated sections for both raw cards and raw comic books. Browse over 100,000 slab collectibles authenticated by the industry's most trusted grading companies. Then check out a massive selection of sealed wax and now raw singles and raw lots. Join a passionate, no-nonsense community of nearly 50,000 members and enjoy some of the best buyer and seller protection in the business. And as always, MySlabs offers one of the most disruptive pricing models in the hobby with seller fees as low as only 1%. So the next time you're forced to pay 10%, 20% or more to sell something from your collection, head over to MySlabs.com, the low fee marketplace by collectors for collectors. All right, let's go on now to my fourth pick here. My fourth pick is actually going to be Avengers number 70 from 1969. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would actually be the first full appearance of the Squadron Sinister, a book that was written by Roy Thomas. And who are the Squadron Sinister? Well, of course, the Squadron Sinister is sort of the uh, Marvel's version of the Justice League, a team made up of characters like Hyperion, Nighthawk, Wizard, and Dr. Spectrum, who effectively are, you know, Superman, Batman, The Flash, and Green Lantern. And I really do think that this is an interesting book to invest in. I mean, with everything going on in the MCU and the multiverse, you know, before, if you asked me, I never would have thought that we could have seen characters like this, but you know, now it feels like very, very possible that we could get characters from these other multiverses coming in as, you know, villains to sort of fight our heroes. And I like this book due to the fact that, you know, this is actually a storyline that has ties to Kang and the Grand Master. And it feels like there's a lot of potential with this one right here. I mean, currently it's rumored that the squadron and Sinister might be showing up in Loki season two. And that would sort of make a lot of sense if Loki is exploring these different multiverses and Kang ends up bringing in, you know, a bunch of his lackeys who happen to be the Squadron Sinister right here. I could see them doing that. But even MCU spec aside, I like characters like Hyperion and Nighthawk. I feel like they've had, you know, influence in Marvel comic books, especially Hyperion. You know, he's really grown to be a character that, you know, collectors actually really do enjoy. Now you may be thinking to yourself, the book to own is actually a Avengers 85, which is also why I have it on the slide right there. That would be the first appearance of the Squadron Supreme, the, you know, superhero version of the Squadron Sinister team. But, you know, I still like Avengers number 70 simply due to the cover. I mean, you get to see the characters on the cover. I think, you know, collectors, even if Hyperion, say, shows up in the MCU, I think collectors will still gravitate to Avengers 70 simply because we see a version of him on the cover. But either way, I like these two books, 70 or 85. If you can find a really nice, 
nice, you know, mid-ish high grade around the $100 level. I think this is a book that's going to continue to go up. All right, let's go on now to my next pick here. My next pick is actually going to be Strange Tales number 180 from 1975. And what is the significance of this? Well, of course, this is the first appearance of Gamora, a book written by Jim Starlin that would actually feature the second appearance of Pip the Troll and the third appearance of Magus. Now, of course, I like this book because it is the first appearance of Gamora. I think Gamora is one of the premier Marvel female characters there is in the MCU and also in Marvel comic books currently. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. You guys are thinking, well, you know, we're going to see her in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. This book will probably have a spike on that, but, you know, uh, that might be the end of the current Guardians roster and we'll never see Gamora again. And even if that is true, one of the things I would push back on and, and say to you guys is that I think that Gamora is now sort of Marvel brand royalty. And what I mean by that is, you know, the Guardians of the Galaxy characters like Rocket Raccoon, Star-Lord, Gamora, etc., have, you know, catapulted themselves into such an S-tier status of character that, you know, when you go to uh, Marvel Disneyland, you see characters like Gamora walking around. You see costume uh, puppeteers for Rocket Raccoon. I mean, I think that the generation of people who love Marvel will still, you know, uh, value Gamora in a very high way. And even if we don't see Gamora in Guardians of the Galaxy number four, I still think that Marvel will be utilizing her in the comic book form. So I really do think that this is a character that is going to stay around in pop culture. And for that reason, I think that this is a great book to own. All right, let's go on out to my next pick here. My next pick is actually gonna be Incredible Hulk number one. 102 from 1968, written by Gary Friedrich. This would be the big premiere issue for the Incredible Hulk run. Now, kind of like the Marvel premiere one, this might be a book that is sort of stretching our $100 budget here. I mean, you know, we might have to go up to the 120, 130 level, but I do think it is possible to, you know, snipe a book like this on a live auction or to find one in the wild being sold around that $100 price point. So I really do like this book for that reason. Now, I like this book because it is the big premiere issue. I think this one is really undervalued uh, compared to its counterpart, big premiere issue comics. When we think about Cap 100, Iron Man 1, Submariner 1, etc., this one is definitely the one that is like one of the least valuable of the set. And I think one of the reasons for that is that, you know, Incredible Hulk has sort of been kind of forgotten as far as like his MCU status is concerned. I mean, because we never really got, you know, his next uh, couple films since we got the Edward Norton version of him. But I really do think that, you know, with everything going on with She-Hulk, where the MCU is going, them sort of acquiring the rights back to the Hulk character, I think that it's possible. This is this is going to be a book that, you know, eventually catches up or the, the market will eventually catch up to this one. And this one will really start to shoot up in its values. I mean, it looks like we're going to see more Mark Ruffalo in the She-Hulk show. It looks like a possibility that we could be leading to a World War Hulk uh, type of a uh, crossover event. So if we do in fact do that, I think that this is going to be a book that, you know, slots right into that price point where people who want to collect the Incredible Hulk character can afford a book like this because we all know Incredible Hulk number one is basically untouchable and anything, you know, prior to this issue right here is really expensive for Hulk collectors. So I think that this is a classic Marie Severn cover that is definitely worth picking up at that $100 price point. Now I also have the Tales to Astonish number 93 on my slide. That's my caveat book. If you don't believe that you can find 102 for a hundred dollars well i would throw out to you that tales to astonish 93 the classic marie severin cover with hulk and silver surfer would also be a great book to pick up at that budget range all right let's move on now to my seventh pick and my seventh pick is actually going to be iron man number 282 from 1992 this would be the first full appearance of of the War Machine Armor, a book written by Len Kaminsky. Now, I, of course, really love this book because later on next year, we're going to be getting the Armor Wars Disney Plus series. I think that this book right here is the book to own uh, for the character of War Machine. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. That's actually Tony Stark in the War Machine Armor. We're going to talk about that one in a second. But in my opinion, I do think that when Armor Wars rolls around, everything War Machine is going to go up in value. And I think that this is a great book to get your hands on. Now, let's talk about some of the other books you see on the slide right there. Of course, there's Iron Man 281. That I would dub the first cameo appearance of the War Machine armor. I mean, key collectors suggest that that's the first appearance, but you know, this is a situation exactly identical to Hulk 180 and ASM 299, where you see, you know, the image of the armor on the last page in the last panel, and then, you know, you get the full appearance in 282. And what do we know about the market with regards to that? You know, the full appearance is the one that collectors want to own, especially since 
since you see the armor on the cover. Now, a lot of people also talk about Avengers number 94. I think that that's also a great book to get your hands on because that's War Machine taking up the code name of you know the War Machine character, but that's not actually the first time that Rhodey wears the armor. So you know, with all these different you know moving parts and caveats and other issues and things like that, 282 to me still feels like the one to own, even if you are a fan of specifically James Rhodes. Now, one of the things that's great about this too is that uh, Rhodey is in fact involved heavily in the 282 storyline, so it's not like he's invisible from this comic book as well. But I like the fact that it has War Machine in the title over the Iron Man. I like the fact that the cover is incredible. And if you can find like a nice uh, near mint rock copy of this thing at the $100 price point, I think that this is going to be a book that 100% blows up once we get Armor Wars in the future. All right, let's move on now to my eighth pick. And my eighth pick is actually going to be Avengers number 62 from 1969. And what is the significance of this? Well, this would actually be the first appearance of the character known as M'Baku, a book written by Roy Thomas. And one of the reasons I like this character is, you know, twofold. One, I think that this character is making a full-on face turn as far as their presence in comic books. And what I mean by that is, you know, at one point this character started as a villain, but it seems like due to the, you know, pop culture, uh, experience with him in the films and what's going on in the comic books, it feels like Marvel is actually deciding, hey, let's make M'Baku an actual superhero because it feels like people really are gravitating to this character. On top of that, it's currently rumored that M'Baku is going to take up the mantle of Black Panther. Now, there was a time when it was rumored that Shuri was going to be taking up the mantle after the passing of Chadwick Boseman, but you know, with everything going on with the controversy around her, it feels like they're moving in the direction of M'Baku. And for that reason, I like this book right here as being significant uh, with regards to what happens next in the Black Panther universe. On top of all that, this is a John Buscema cover. You gotta love the John Buscema covers. All right, let's go on now to my ninth pick here. My ninth pick is actually gonna be New Mutants number 87 from 1990. And what is the significance of this? Well, of course you guys know, this is the first full appearance of the character known as Cable, a book written by Rob Liefeld. And of course, Cable, you guys know, was played by Josh Brolin in the Deadpool franchise. He is also the character that was, you know, I would argue as sort of the narrative glue to the X-Men animated show from back in the day. And those two reasons are really some of the reasons why I like this book and the potential for this book to go up in value, especially if you can find it at this $100 price point. I mean, we already know that we're going to be getting a Deadpool number three. And I think it's safe to assume that Josh Brolin would be showing up once again as the Cable character. On top of all this, you know, we're getting the X-Men uh, 97 animated series on Disney+. Plus. Uh, I would suspect that we are going to have a return from the character of Cable in that animated series as well. So, and so for that reason, you have two different touch points for Cable uh, having an impact in pop culture. All right, let's move on now to my last pick for books to invest in on a hundred dollar budget. And I have sort of a trifecta of books here, a sort of choose your own adventure. But we're going to start by calling this Marvel Superheroes number thirteen from 1968. And what is the significance of that book? Well, that, that one, of course, is the first appearance of the character Carol Danvers. Now, of course, we know Carol Danvers is played by Brie Larson in the MCU. She would go on to become, you know, Ms. Marvel and then later on Captain Marvel, uh, specifically Captain Marvel in her uh, film that we saw there. Uh, she's going to be making her return in the Marvels uh, later on next year. And I really do think that, you know, any one of these three books has the potential to, you know, be a good investment investment if you actually spend, you know, around that $100 price point. Now, personally, I think that the Marvel Super Heroes 13, because of the fact that it's a Silver Age book, is probably, quote unquote, the safest one to invest your money in. The fact that it is the first appearance of the character uh, has a lot of value to it. You know, it, it doesn't seem like Brie Larson is going anywhere. It feels like, you know, eventually, even though collectors and, and movie fans didn't love the first Captain Marvel movie, it does seem like, you know, over time, they might be able to eventually get this character to write, uh, get people on board with her. So you never really know with this sort of thing. I also like Miss Marvel number one. I mean, a nice Bronze Age book. Um, that one to me feels like maybe the best bang for your buck where you have her, you know, representing also the superhero version of the character. And then you, of course, you have Avenging Spider-Man number nine. That's the first time that Carol Danvers takes up the mantle of Captain Marvel. So, you know, the closest version to what we see currently in the MCU. So, you know, whether it's Marvel Superheroes 13 as like a VG copy, 
Ms. Marvel 1 or Avenging Spider-Man 9. You know, you're looking at Nierman copies for that. Uh, if you can find any of these books around the $100 price point, you know, depending on what you like, depending on what kind of a copy you prefer, I think you're going to do well for yourself. Anyways, that's all for this video. Those were 10 books to invest in on a $100 budget. Now, of course, I'm giving you guys a price window. So, you know, you're going to have to use your discretion. You know, maybe you can find those ones right now on eBay as Buy It Now's. Maybe you can find them in the wild. But I think if you pick up any of these books, you know, nice presenting versions of themselves at that price point, you're going to be happy that you did. Anyways, that's all I have for this video. Drop me a like, comment, subscribe if you're enjoying the content, and I'll see you in the next one.